So welcome, Mary, to this uh, days and works of Mary Jackson. And uh, let's start from the very beginning of uh, you and before you were even conceived. And uh, what was the year that you were born? I was born in 1951. 51, so perhaps 1950 or a little earlier than that. And let's visit uh, through your narrative the space that you were conceived, gestated, and then born. Where was it? <clears throat> so I was born in Southern Illinois in the US. And I came to a family, I was my mother's seventh pregnancy. So there were already a lot of children there before I arrived. And um, my father was a preacher and my mother was a stay-at-home mom until I was around six years old. I was the last child. And um, there was a lot of love in my family. And there was also a lot of dysfunction in the family. And I knew my parents were doing their very best. And I think they were in overwhelm a lot of the time. Yeah. Mm. Mary, what was the name of your mom and your dad? Um, my mother was Evelyn May Hume and took the last name of Jackson when she got married. And my father was Charles Stoboy Jackson. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and where was it? Uh, I mean, uh, where uh, the name of the city or the space uh, you were born. Uh, you mentioned it. Can you speak uh, a little bit more about, uh, you know, the energy of that environment uh, in which your family uh, had a living? Okay. Um, so I was born in a small town, Taylorville, Illinois. And we lived in Morrisonville, Illinois, and it was a very small town of maybe 1,800 people. And it was a flat land with cornfields and wheat fields all around it. And um, yeah, I, I lived there until I was 11 years old, and then we our whole family moved to California. Um, but it was a I tiny did. town with just one main street through it, and it, that was maybe two blocks long. And, you know, just the essential stores of groceries and the bank and the drugstore, that kind of thing. Very small. And news got around town very quickly about whatever was happening with different families in the area. Right. What were the values of the people and life in that uh, little 800 people village that you started your life in? Um, well, there there were many religious people. It was mainly Protestants and some Catholic people. Um, and that was not a wealthy community. You know, it was, you know, farm workers and um, people who ran the stores and not a lot of wealth. And um, the community was pretty tight knit. There were always events happening where everyone would get together. And if a family had someone sick, you know, the whole town would be bring them food and help support them through the challenges of their lives. So it was it was a real communal experience. Everybody knew everybody. And the kids would just roam in the streets freely. And, you know, there'd be a whole gang of us just playing together and do, roaming around town. And it was fairly safe, really safe. Yeah. And because it is very, uh, very early after the Second World War, um, what was uh, the impact 
if there was any impact of uh, the war on that area or on the people or in general? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, it, the big depression um, hit my, my father's family hard um, when that happened and his family lost everything. And there were five children in his family. And my mother was one of 11, 11 girls. And they, they lived in Canada and had come there from Wales. And my father was German and Irish. My mother was Scottish and Welsh. And, um, and so they had been through hard times. And um, after the war was over, you know, things were pretty scarce. It wasn't so abundant with food and finances, all of that. So <clears throat> most of the people in town were on the poorer side that lived in our village. Yeah. However, that uh, chrono space uh, element was ideal for you, or so I guess. What blessings uh, were there in that place at that time for you? What blessings were there, did you say? Is that, yes. Yeah. yeah. I think, <clears throat> you know, my my parents being religious people they they would pray every day for any of the families in the town who were having challenges and as well as around the world they were conscious of different you know what was happening in the world and they prayed every day for you know an hour every morning for all the different things going on on the planet and <clears throat> they had a lot of faith and trust that we would be protected and um, they were, they had very sharing hearts that if there was a family in need that, you know, we would give them hand-me-down clothes and share our food with them and vice versa. When we were going through a hard time, people really showed up with food for us. And so it was, we were taught to really look after one another and also take care of people who were in need. And my heart always felt so deeply for those who were going through challenging times. And I think I really learned that from my parents. It was a blessing. Yeah. Right. Do you remember things from your grandparents, from your paternal grandparents, for example? My grandparents had all passed by the time I was three. And I do not have a lot of memory of them. I do know that my maternal grandmother was a midwife. And she would attend home births with a doctor and they would go by horse and carry their bags of supplies and attend people's births at home. And um, I know that she wrote a book on herbology and um, I didn't find that out until I shared with my mother that I wanted to become a midwife. And then she told me that about my grandmother. So midwifery runs in the family. Yes. The value of midwifery. Yes. Isn't it interesting? Yes. And right from the beginning, from your childhood, what did you want to do? Well, ever since I was around five years old, I always wanted to have a baby. And that could come from, you know, my family life or the cultural influences, you know, many places. But every picture of me, as a young child, I had either a doll or a live baby in my arms, and I could just spend all day with babies. <laughs> and, um, you know, as I grew older, <clears throat> I really wanted to find um, my passion to find a work that I really love to do and not just to trade my hours for pay that I got, but to find some kind of a um profession that I just loved to do and wanted to be there doing it and I did get to find that twice so I'm really grateful right uh, so what uh, were you looking for on a soul level we seen to be with children babies uh, mm -hmm. and uh, 
doing this uh, so diligently with such dedication over the decades that followed? Mm -hmm. um, well, in my intention, I held that <clears throat> I wanted to make some kind of a contribution to the planet that supported more peace to be in people's lives. And um, I wanted to figure out what it was that supported families to really stay together and learn how to work things out. And for the babies, there was just something that was so open and beautiful. Like when I looked in their eyes, there was no stop. It just I could just look into their souls and they would look back at me in that same way. And there was something about being met soul to soul that I just loved that I didn't get from older people. And um, I think that was one of the things that kept bringing me back to the babies. Yeah, there was something, yeah, there's something so pure and beautiful in them. Yeah. You started with the baby as the mm -hmm. first inspirator, mm -hmm. and then did you meet uh, other uh, people or uh, circumstances or uh, nature? I don't know. What was next? Mm -hmm. I think nature was there even before the babies. Um, ah. Because I... At a very young age, I would resource my in nature. You know, it was just a place I would go to fill, get filled up. Um, you know, the the parents were super busy with all the kids and their work and surviving. And I spent a lot of time outside in the trees and um, on my bike riding through the country. And I loved feeling the breeze on my skin and and seeing the green all around and playing in the wheat fields and the corn fields. And, you know, I just, I loved being in nature. And when something challenging would happen or I was upset, I would always go to nature to, that helped me to settle. And I still do that today, even at 73. I, I just last month, my husband and I went backpacking to a river behind Ohio and we spent five days sitting by the river and hiking and it was beautiful so i still i still connect with nature and that is a huge resource for me especially if there's water so fresh water you said yeah so uh mary you spoke about babies being uh, leaders inspirators leading to this uh, soul open uh, uh, area where you uh, you meet you connect with the purity of uh, being nature what what is nature for you mm. nature brings the peace the quiet the slow pace the settled feeling in my family there was a lot of chaos and i could always go to nature for quiet so it was the it was the feeling of settling with nature and in the green and the smell of the flowers and the little insects and all of that. It just they gave me a settled feeling, filled me up. Right. So it was kind of it had it or it carries uh, healing uh, qualities. Nature has healing qualities and uh, bringing uh, uh, balance uh, when uh, there is uh, sort of uh, disturbance uh, in yes. an outer family or whatever, right? Yes, exactly. And then, yes. and then Mary, so first nature, then baby, and then, and then let's see. I think my older sister was an inspiration. She was a very free spirit 
and she left home at 18 and I was um, eight and uh, she went to college and she just went for life and was so interested in everything and really intelligent and she would come home and visit and with these great stories of her travels and the people she met and what she was learning and and I really loved seeing the freedom in her and uh, my the third child that was born my one of my older sisters Rebecca <clears throat> my first one was Joanne and Rebecca was um she was sort of a loner and very into um the arts and philosophers she was always reading philosophy books and a real seeker she really was wanting to find the truth about life and why we're here and what it all means and you know moved to Greenwich Village at a time when there was Bob Dylan and Joan Baez and you know different people around that she was very inspired by and um, she took a real different path than anybody else in our family and I really was inspired by her journey as well so I think both of those two sisters really inspired me a lot is there any story you remember which was a very significant uh, story for you to keep from your sisters, um, either Rebecca or the other? I think, you know, that I have this one image of in the snow in the winter, the season we had really, you know, very distinct seasons in Illinois. And when there was snow, I remember um, as a young child riding down this hill on a sled with my biggest sister and sitting behind her, between her legs and just like racing down this hill and just seeing the snow, you know, flying up and feeling the cold air on our faces and just laughing our heads off together. We had this like uncontrollable laughter and we did that a lot together the laughing and that's one of the memories i love about her she was so ready to express and share and and connect yeah so we had art and philosophy and freedom and uh, following your heart her heart for the uh, eldest sister and uh, showing the way and uh, sharing moments of joy and uh, uh, acceleration right and connection yes, yes. Right. yeah and with my third sister becky um we sh we shared the love of nature and we were always going going on adventures in nature to find waterfalls and pools to swim in and forests to white walk through and be together outside. She moved to Hawaii and I would visit her there quite often. And uh, we would just spend a lot of time in the beautiful nature. And then what was the next stop in the inspiration journey of yours? Well, in my my early 20s, um, I was introduced to the first midwife that I ever knew. And um, her name was Louise Scott. And she was a lay midwife who had come from New Mexico to California. And my friend Ephraim French introduced me to her. And she was starting a class to teach a group of women about midwifery. And I was so excited to hear about that because I had taken a class at the City College in Santa Barbara that got me into the hospital to observe different areas of, of the hospital and one of the areas was birth. And the first birth I saw just put something together inside of me where I just knew this is it. This is where I want to stand in my life. I don't want to do it this way, but this is the work I want to do. And so after I was doing that class, Ephraim introduced me to Louise 
and I joined her midwifery course and studied with her and learned to become a lay midwife from apprenticeship. And, mm-hmm. um, and I just loved birth. I felt like, you know, if I hadn't a- attended a birth in a couple of weeks, something huge was missing from my life, you know, after I got into it. And, um, and in doing midwifery, again, I was so curious about, you know, what, what really supports families to have the birth they dream of and what supports them to have healthy relationships and can it be, you know, a supportive, equally supportive, mutually cooperative situation. And I just started looking into the relationships of all the different families I worked with and saw that that was possible. And um, so the families were a big inspiration. And again, the babies, you know, to be able to greet the new beings that were coming to this planet, to be one of the first people to touch them and welcome them was such an honor. And um, mm-hmm. I, I loved that work. I, this is my 50th year of being a midwife. And I've attended between 2,500 and 3,000 home births. And, um, and I just love it. So I think midwifery was my next, next inspiration. Thank mm-hmm. you. Thank yeah. you. So you met Louise, and uh, she was an inspirator, and uh, she uh, showed it to you this way, not the college way or the hospital way, but right. this way. Yes. Yes, you know, which was very empowering for the families to <clears throat> start parenting off by having a home birth. They really would feel like, wow, we did this ourselves. We can do anything from here. If we got through our birth, then we can do anything. So parenting became like an easier job than than what it may have been because they felt so empowered by, you know, having their births at home and really doing it themselves. And um, yeah, it just, it you know, it was I was so curious to see how when there was a successful home birth, they felt so empowered. And if they had to transfer to the hospital, there was a different feeling, you know, in the mom and her partner. And, and, um, and so I wondered, like, you know, birth happens in so many different ways, not everybody's going to be able to birth at home. And how do we support those who have a birth that is different than what they dreamed of? And so I was looking for you know, what causes complications, what do we do to support them in a better way, and how do we support them to integrate once, you know, the birth has gone on a different path than what they had planned. And um, Phyllis, Phyllis and Marshall Klaus came to Santa Barbara and gave a talk. And Marshall Klaus and Kendall had done research on um, babies in the hospital being born and separated from their mothers and they had put out this little book I forget the name of it right now I wish I could remember it um, but a little booklet on how babies who had been separated for a significant time from their mothers ended up back in the emergency room with you know having been neglected or mistreated and so they were starting to see how important that bond and connection is right from the start from the moment they're born on and even before. And so it really opened my eyes to look at how powerful the impact of birth is on the parents and the baby and what their relationship becomes. And so I really wanted to find out more about that and started, um, well, I went, the next inspiration was to go to France and study with Michel Odant who brought water birth to America. And he's a French physician who attended birth in such a different way than I'd ever seen a doctor do. You know, he was so not attached to his ego and the midwives would, you know, catch the babies and he'd be in the room perhaps, you know, but there was no need for him to rescue or save the day. And he would be there in case there was an, you know, a complication. And um, he was already looking at how, how 
the way the mother was born had an impact on how she would birth her baby. And that opened up another part in me that made me look at even before our birth, you know, of, of giving birth, what happened to us in being born impacts the way our bodies respond to give birth. So I started getting so curious about that. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then discovered APA and started going to conferences there and heard David Chamberlain talk, you know, about how babies remember their birth. And I always thought as a midwife, like I pretty much knew what babies knew and I was so connected with them and loved them. But that book, Babies Remember the Birth, and, and his talk just opened my eyes again to this whole other depth of how much babies take in their experiences and record them from even before birth, at, during their, their gestation and conception, and even before that. So I've learned that um, babies' consciousness is so developed. Their little bodies are immature, and they look not developed but and so sometimes we think they're helpless and maybe not aware but they are so aware and they so take it all in and I've seen it over and over proved through children showing their star stories through play and uh, just exactly repeating the birth story as it happened with like 10 things in sequence in the same order as what they occurred at birth so I just have no doubt about how much babies record. So David Chamberlain opened that up to me and what I would see his, he and his wife Donna at the conferences. And then in the 90s, um, I met Ray Castellino and um, he had come to Santa Barbara in the 90s and was doing this interesting work with babies and he had been studying with William Emerson and then they became colleagues. And he was doing really interesting work with families and babies, supporting them to integrate their early experiences. And he would work with families and adults and take in forms and histories about their lives and see what their challenge was in this present moment. And then follow the thread back to what happened in their early histories that is still having an impact on how they view the world today. And me as a midwife, I was looking at, you know, where families are before they conceive and supporting them to conceive a child, prepare, you know, follow them through care in, in their gestation and the pregnancy, and then attend their birth and watch the outcome of how all of that before um, experiences impacted the child as they grew up in our communities because I have a small village that lives around me and I watch the babies I have caught grow up and they come back to me and they've had babies with me now. So I get to I got to watch from before we were here um, and how the and do work before babies are conceived and how they're birthed and then watch what happens in their lives and and where they are when they come back to work with me for their pregnancy. So Ray and I had views from opposite directions and we got very excited, you know, to share what we were learning from the families. And I ended up taking his two year, two and a half year training, the Castellino Foundation training, and totally caught on fire about this pre and perinatal work, just loved it. And it made so much sense and it changed the way I could be present at birth, it changed the way I was in my family that I created with my husband and um, how I viewed myself. And um, I just was on fire and was talking to all my pregnant families about, you know, what I was learning. And they got very excited and they wanted to do the work as well. So Ray and I started a, a practice called About Connections. And we supported any of my families who wanted to do the work, uh, to do the work to integrate how they were born, to integrate challenging experiences early on so that they could differentiate from those experiences and have more freedom of choice with what they were going through now. And um, 
when we first started our practice together, I had a transfer rate from home to hospital um, in a practice with two other midwives that I was working with. That was about 20% that once a woman was in labor, 20% of them would need to go to the hospital. And I kept thinking that the longer I was a midwife, the more I would understand what it really took to support families to birth at home. And that was not what I was seeing. And that was probably 25 years into being a midwife. And when I started working with Ray, I had, before Ray, maybe 20 births would happen in a row that were born at home, and then there would be a transfer. But once the people started doing this work with us, um, my transfer rate dropped to 3%. And so in the first 63 births that I did with families doing the work, they were all, they all birthed at home. And um, in the first 100 births of families doing the work, um, only six had to transfer to the hospital. So it was 6% transfer rate. So it, it felt like we were really figuring something out that the more they integrated their early experiences and especially around how they were born, um, that it really supported them to have the birth they dreamed of. So that was very exciting. Mm. And then how did this uh, grow? I mean, uh, you are somewhere 2000, something like that in terms of time, uh, or 2010, something like that. Uh, then uh, how did this uh, develop even further? How did, did it mature? <clears throat> okay, so I never wanted to be a teacher of this work. I was um, a pretty shy person. <clears throat> and to be seen and heard and be in front of a group was not my comfortable place. <laughs> um, but Ray had asked me to assist the next training after the one I took. And I assisted him in the next training. And then the next training, um, and he asked me to co-teach with him and it was the first time he had asked someone to co-teach and so i've been involved with 10 trainings now <clears throat> of the castellino foundation training and um my love for it just kept expanding and growing because as i got to support pe people in learning this work and working on themselves and seeing them transform with what they were putting together about their lives. Like their history was their history and we can never change our history, but we can change the relationship that we have to our history. And that's what we were doing with them is just um, helping them to have coherence around what happened and differentiate what happened then and what behaviors they had to develop to survive those experiences. Um, differentiate from what was happening now so that they, they had more freedom of choice. And that was just so rewarding that I dove full in to, to this work. And um, this year, I think I'm finally admitting that I'm retiring from midwifery. I heard this rumor that I was retiring for about three or four years now, and I was still doing some verse. But this year, I feel like maybe I'm letting go of that and just only going to do the teaching work. So I do a lot of teaching of the foundation trainings. I do, I teach graduate programs for the people who have gone through the training. I lead womb surround process workshops, small group, you know, uh, experiences. And also I do um, private practice of supporting families, couples, individuals. So I do all aspects of the work. That's how it grew. Right. Uh, Mary, where and when did you meet your husband? And what was the special in him which uh, uh, spoke to your soul and you have been together? Uh -huh. So <clears throat> when I was young, I promised myself I was just going to be with one one man for marriage and that I did not want to split up a family and I wanted to figure it out so that it could be that way and um, 
I was looking for a person that I could meet on all levels, not just one or two, but every all the levels. And um, a friend of mine, uh, he was born and raised, Alex Loba is his name, and he was born and raised in Italy. And one of my friends that I met at 17 had gone to Europe and discovered him and brought him back and married him. And after about seven years of their marriage, they split up and divorced. And then Alex and I got together. And um, it was just so easy and comfortable to be with him. And I really trusted his love. And it felt like he could be the man that I could spend the rest of my life with. And um, one day he was professing his love to me in this beautiful way. And I really got that, yeah, you're, you're the man I want to be with. And I also got terrified that if I love you this much and you love me this much, then it also means that I could get equally as hurt. And something just like, arose in me that caused me to bolt I just ran out the door up the mountain and he was a runner at that time he was running like four and five miles in the mountains every day and he ran after me and could not catch me and um, all of a sudden I'm on the top of this mountain and I hear this <sighs> you know heavy breathing coming behind me and I turn around and it was like what am I doing I'm running away from love and this is what I've been looking for and at that moment, I decided that it was worth the risk of being hurt because I really felt so much love for this person. And um, mm -hmm. I turned toward him and we hugged and we sat down and cried and talked and, you know, had one of the deepest conversations of my life. And from that moment on, we were moving forward toward being together always. And we did that. We're still together. He uh, 37 years of marriage. Yeah. Have you answered to the question that you asked yourself? And on that day up in the mountains, why are you uh, escaping or running away from love? Have you answered to that question? Yeah, it was terror. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was total fear because I knew that if I, my heart was so open to him, and I knew that I, if I left my heart open that in the humanness of our our lives that I could also get really hurt by him. And so I think it was the fear that the hurt could be as deep as the love and I wanted to protect myself. And then once I got up to the top of the mountain, it was like I have been looking for this for a lot of my life. And here at, at 37 years old, I finally, finally found the man that I want to be with. And why am I running? I do not know. I'm going to stop that right now. And just turned around and went toward him. Yeah. Right. And you had, in these 36, 37 years you've been together, did you have a family? Have you had, do you have a family? Yes, children? we do. Yes, we have two children and they were both born at home with midwives and I have a, an amazing human, healthy, whole son named Marco Loba <clears throat> and he, is, um, he has just been such an easy person to raise and he lives in Berkeley and he's a biochemist and he studied under Jennifer Doudna who discovered CRISPR for five years he he was um, under her mentorship and made his own discovery and he is up in the Bear, Bay Area now uh, he created a business that he's running and uh, very successful and loves m climbing rocks you know rock climbing and uh, skiing and backpacking and ballroom dancing and he's just a well-rounded human being and a delight to sure. be with. He's he is really one of my very best friends. I love him so much. And we also had a daughter, Emily Loba. You said hand. Yeah. <clears throat> Just like pausing. It's okay. and, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's okay. Yeah. So, 
So, Emily, you know, when I was wanting to get pregnant with Marco, I was asking for health, harmony, family harmony, humor, beauty, all good things. And I got Marco. He was, he's totally all of that. <clears throat> and when we were conceiving um, Emily, I asked for a teacher. And um, we know that somebody who I could support with why they were coming to this earth to clear, you know, their pathway and somebody who supported me in doing that with my life as well. What was I thinking? You know, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and I got her. She was born and um, she was born with a condition called arthrogryposis. And it's a condition that limits all the range of motion in her joints. And um, so she had little hands that couldn't grasp, you know, and her hips were out of their socket and double clubbed feet and many things. And um, had just such an opposite path through her life that than her brother did Marco. Marco was like all the doors open to him and everything came so easily most of the time. And with Emily, she had to work so hard for every inch of the way through her life, you know, to be accepted socially, uh, went through, you know, some major surgeries, uh, was in pain 24-7, and, um, and was a beautiful being. She could look into people's souls and just know who they were. And... Um, People were so touched by her life. They said just sitting beside Emily, it felt like they knew themselves better just from being in her presence and the way she saw them. And Emily learned to um, dance through her pain. She had a mentor, Holly Johnson, who taught her dance in connection with emotional work. And um, Emily went all the way through her program and had graduated and at 28 years old she was you know just about to experience her first uh freedom in being under out from under our care because she needed help with her daily care and she had moved to northern california and found two caregivers that could support her each day and got a little cabin in the redwoods which was her favorite place to be in the redwoods it just settled something inside of her so deeply and she went there and lived for five and a half weeks and through holly's work she learned to dance out of her pain so that for the first time in her life she was pain free and i'll remember this day forever where she was standing in the garden and she goes mom guess what and i said what she says, I have no pain. It's like, what? I have never heard you say that. She said, I feel no pain. And for the last three months of her life, she had no pain. And so anyway, she was living up there in this little cabin alone. And then the, the caregivers would come each day to help her with, you know, body care and preparation for food and, um, They received a bed frame in the mail and uh, they tried to put it together, her and one of the caregivers, Bailey, and they needed another hand. And so she had, they had both been at this uh, live music concert a week before and had, she had danced with the man and um, they ran into him in the grocery store and they said, and he was a homeless person and they asked, um, would he come and help? put the bed frame together and so they gave him a ride because they thought she, he he might want the job and earn some money and they gave him a ride to her house so he saw that she had a car and a roof and a computer and food and he wanted everything and so he took it he put everything in her van, her food, her clothes, her toothbrush, her everything, all the food from the cupboards, the freezer, the fridge, and and uh, put it in her van and her dog and took off and 
killed her. And he could have taken everything and left her because she was defenseless. She couldn't protect herself. And, and he killed her and took everything. And so that was the end of her life. Um, totally shattering, totally shocking and horrific for us. Felt like we exploded into a million pieces. You know, just never expected something so violent to happen with her. And um, and yet there's something that I know that um, she completed something for herself. I think she really did what she came here to do and um, very challenged with her life, but she made the best of it and she still smiled so much and laughed her head off. I never laughed harder with anyone than I did with her and we miss her terribly. So. That was just horrendous. I didn't know how to, you know, walk through that experience. I didn't know if I could ever come back to enjoy the beauty of sunlight on a flower again or smile, laugh. And the love from the community that came to us was enormous. And it really carried us through it. People who let us grieve with them and they would share their tears while we cried and they brought brought us flowers and love and chocolate and food and you know just hung out with us and it was beautiful and we also mm -hmm. got to have Emily's body and bring it to the place where we stayed up in Northern California when she passed and we um I got to bathe her and oil her body and dress her in these little clothes I got for her. And, and there were 13 of our friends, of her friends that came to be with us in Northern California. And we just laid her on the bed and we put flowers all over her body and around her and sang to her and wrote poems to her and played her favorite music and danced. We laughed and cried with her. And um, like when when I first got there near her body, it just felt like her soul was just like trembling, shaking. And after we were with her for that 20, you know, that whole day, it just felt like something had really soothed down in her soul, like had quieted down. And it, and it felt like for us, we got to send her off in the way we would have wanted to had she had you know, some illness or disease that she was dying with, that we got to support her in that way after the fact that just was so healing for all of us. And it felt like it really supported her too. So. What a soul. Was, yes, quite a soul. Amazing artist. She couldn't grasp, but she could, we figured out how to crochet and knit with, you know, holding the little crochet needle with two hands and she just made beautiful uh, paintings and clothing and danced so amazingly beautiful and she was told she would never walk when she was born we that's what the doctors all told us and she totally walked and danced and such a strong spirited girl she was yeah. fierce fierce yeah so this uh, can start uh, a series of lessons uh, or uh, yeah, the wisdom you gained uh, over the years uh, until now. So from this uh, relationship uh, with uh, that beautiful like, lady daughter, what, uh, what was it uh, that you keep as a great message for your life and for the humanity. Mm. Well, something that I watched Emily do over and over again in her life was she would have fear to go out into the world. And, you know, she loved road trips and she'd take her van and go off by herself and she couldn't even get her shoes and socks on and off by herself. So she would have to ask someone, a stranger to help her do that. And so what I learned from her was that you can have like the biggest fear in your life, 
but don't let the fear stop you because she would continue to pursue what it was she was going after. She wanted to dance. At three years old, she wanted to dance. At four years old, she, she, I put her in this ballet class because she wanted ballet. And, um, you know, I had taken her to see this uh, night, uh, Nutcracker um, performance. And when we went to our seat, she was like, what are we doing back here? I want to be up there. And it was like, oh, on stage. And she said, yes, this is at three. I said, well, you have to work hard to do that. And so every day after we, we went there, she would ask me, can I go to my dance class? And it was like, okay, but how about modern dance or jazz or free form, something like that? And it was like, no, it has to be ballet. And she wore these little leg braces and high top tennis shoes. And we took her to her ballet class and she loved it. And the next Christmas, she was in the Nutcracker, and she was a little cherry bonbon with her little tutu. And when she went up on stage with her leg braces and tennis shoes, the entire audience was in tears. And um, it was just so moving to see her courage. And she just thought she was doing the best job of anyone. And, you know, just it was so uh, empowering for her to have you know accomplished that at four she really set her mind to it and did it and that's how she lived her life she would see something she would set her goal and she would totally make it so mm -hmm. so i think right. you know let your fear be there but don't let it stop you i mean sometimes it's healthy to stop from the fear but other times it's just um a lack of courage and you need that you need, need to go for it even though there's fear and the other thing is right. to not wait to do what you really want to do because you never know when you won't be able to do that and Emily would often tell me well let's do that soon mom whatever we were wanting to do and I would go well why and she said because maybe one of us won't be able to do that at some point let's do it now and um, mm -hmm. after she passed, there were so many things we wanted to do together and still share. And uh, and we didn't get to do that. So I just say, don't put off your dreams, you know, really live your life and do the things you mm -hmm. want to do now before it's too late. Excellent. And uh, Mary, what have you learned? Uh, from the relationships uh, you observed or you were present uh, in the families, uh, in the so many families uh, you worked with? What did I learn from them? Yeah, from observing and studying and having the opportunity to uh, to, to be be at least a witness, an observer of all of these uh, relationships uh, connected with uh, conception, gestation, birth, postpartum, and uh, growth of the families. What what was the lesson that uh, the wisdom that you got? You also have thirty six years of mm -hmm. being with uh, Alex. So what is the secret formula of relationships that thrive? Yeah. So, you know, healthy family, healthy relationship is really supportive to um, having people meet their goals. And it's when, you know, mother and partner, whether it's male or female, that they are they equally support each other and it's not like one is in control and the other is inferior but it's like they're they really respect each other equally and they support each other in their dreams and um have healthy attachments with each other healthy connections and um that when the family when the parents can integrate their early experiences there's something that frees them up from having that be such a strong influence on how they perceive their own pregnancy, birth, and, you know, parenting. So 
Ray and I would support them to integrate what the what the challenges were early in their history, but also what the beauty and the blessings were, what was what supported them to get through those challenging times and uh, where did they resource themselves and what was the connection for them that helped them through the the hard things and the good things. And um, and one of the images I have is that, you know, when we're coming into physical form, it's like wherever, you know, there's many different religious beliefs about this and people have different perspectives. And I'm not saying that mine is the right way or the only way, but how through this work, I've after working with people around preconception and conception experiences they've grown through, um, there's just like this image of the soul is like this pure essence of energy that's coming down into become a human being. And in that pureness, that's like the foundation of who the essence of that being is that stays with us forever. It never leaves, it never goes away. And it underlies all the experiences and imprints that come to a person. So as we're coming in as these pure beings, the first thing that we run into for the imprinting is the energetic field of um, mother and her partner and whatever it is their ancestral lines hold. So there's the impact of this, this energetic impression on the new soul coming in. And as they get conceived, that's more physical. And um, there's another layer of imprint from mother, mother and partner, mother, father, there's a sperm from somewhere, you know, so that has an impact. And then through the gestation, um, the baby sees the mother's body as their outer being. So whatever experience the mother has, the baby has an ex some experience of that also. And they don't really differentiate between what's theirs and what's their mother's. So a lot of babies in the womb can take on things from the mother that aren't really theirs. Like maybe the mother has depression, you know, or maybe... Um, the mother has a lot of um, anxiety in her and the baby might take it on as their own. And as we work with adults who live through that in, in the womb and differentiate what the imprints are from who their true essence is, it, there's just this freeing up of their spirit to really be who they originally started out being. And the layers of, of the imprints just start to peel off and um, it's a quite a beautiful transformation to see that happen. So we support, you know, the, the parents to integrate their early histories. We support them to deepen their own relationship and do exercises with them that support that, have them do things at home. Um, <clears throat> yeah, really the preparation during pregnancy is where we <clears throat> help them really deepen into knowing this work more. Mary, uh, since the very early days when you met Louise and then uh, Marshall, Klaus, and then uh, uh, Michel Laudan and uh, uh, David Chamberlain and uh, Ray Castellino and all the beautiful colleagues you met, uh, and you have been a good uh, student, a dedicated uh, uh, colleague, and uh, a, a, a collaborator. Uh, what is it that helps people who are inspired to follow their path and excel? What is it? What is this uh, quality that, uh, because the inspirator is there and does their work uh, naturally, uh, and some are inspired, some are not inspired, but this is not uh, his or her job. So what is it uh, that it's our job? your task. What was it that made you an inspired to inspire? Mm. 
Well, in this work, you know, we have to do our own work to be better tools to support other people. And um, looking at my own early history and starting to integrate what was there and what I had lived through and make sense of what that was and to look at the gifts that I was given from the challenges as well as all the love and uh, positive experiences. Um, I just started to have a passion for certain aspects of the work. One of them was um, the sequencing of our experiences, how we go through birth, like the order of how things happened and how we still repeat our sequences even as adults from what the imprints were from early on at conception, gestation, birth, wherever it was. And I started working with other people to put their sequencing of birth together and then looking at the challenges they had today and seeing that, wow, you know, in the beginning, you know, there was a pain medication that was given to your mother in labor. And, um, um, oh, wait, say so first there was, um, okay, I'm just thinking of this one client where first in, in her, their labor, the mother was given Pitocin to induce. And then after the Pitocin, she had pain medication. And in this man's life, every morning he would wake up and he had to have a cup of coffee. And so that's sort of a stimulant like the Pitocin was, you know. And then after a while, he had to smoke a joint. And after a while of labor, then there was pain medication that came in. And, you know, and, and I just started seeing like people's sequencing today in their adult life is so related to what happened in the beginning. And so um, I got so curious about this with with everybody and really dove into it deeply. So finding the areas of the work where I had passion about and what really affected my being and the way I was able to be present with people and sharing that with my pregnant clients got them excited because I had so much love and passion for it that they wanted to look into their own histories. So I think it was sort of contagious that, you know, it just started to spread and then the practice about connections happened. And then I was teaching, you know, the trainings with Ray at first. And then um, after he passed, then Tara Blasco and I became co-facilitators and we're, we're doing the trainings now. And uh, before Ray passed, the three of us were working together. So we're sort of carrying on that work now with Sandra Castellino, who was Ray's wife. Tara, Sandra, and I are the runners of the, the business now. And the Castellino training still go on. But I think it was really, you know, just feeling how much this work changed me personally and professionally that lit a fire that just made me not be able to stop talking about it. Yeah. So actually, Mary, uh, what it is the stone that you added to this building of uh, this artifact of prenatal sciences. Okay, so I, what can you, you I didn't understand. What did I consider? What do you consider? Yeah, oh, uh, it, uh, it, uh, Ray Castellino was uh, one of the last uh, people who inspired you, but uh, there were a lot more starting from nature to him. And uh, since uh, 1950s, the 1950s, uh, when you were born and uh, started your life, uh, you had uh, some decades of uh, good, passionate uh, service uh, of kindness. What do you think is your own little contribution or big contribution to the development of the understanding of what is going on that is significant in the prenatal field, perinatal field. Mm -hmm. 
Well, one thing is, you know, the the uh, the level of awareness that these new beings have, <clears throat> babies in the womb, even before they're in the womb, <clears throat> it feels like there's consciousness and and also when they're born, you can just see that they have come in with so much knowing. There's so much knowing in them. And every action is telling us a story and showing us something. Every expression. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we can miss it if we don't know how to, to read it. <clears throat> so there's something about slowing down enough to go to match the pace of the newborn. And just the ability to, to be with them without having to do or fix anything, but just the quality of being in connection, open-hearted with kindness and love and meeting them right where they are. That gives such a beautiful connection and opens a field for them to express whatever they're remembering or going through. And watching babies do that and watching them reenact their birth and do it a few times and then show us the way it was they wanted to be born through their movements and their emotional expression was astounding to see that happen. Because as their midwife, during labor, I would be doing vaginal exams and feel the position of the baby and know the rotation of how they found their way down through the pelvic uh, cavity in the mother's body and, and out through the birth. And then when they were out of the womb, to see how they crawled up the mother's body, um, that it was actually they were showing the story of what the journey was that they made down through the pelvis. And that was sort of mind opening and expanding like, oh my goodness, I can I go back and catch my very first baby because I was so missing that all of that was happening. And um, and the integration, like if they, it was a challenging birth with vacuum extractor or, you know, Vontus or forceps or cesarean, <clears throat> um, when we work with babies early on in, you know, not so far distant from the experience, the result could happen so simply and easily with the babies when they got to show and tell their story, have somebody see it, understand it, and be with their feelings around it, and apologize with them and do repair. It just could happen so simply, rather than, you know, going through their whole lives and then coming to the realization of what's impacting them today, and having lived with it through all of that, could be, you know, a lot more therapy or sessions than, you know, when you get those fresh little newborns who just went through the experience. So opening up to what it is that babies have to show and tell us and learning how to be in connection with them and how to support them to integrate what they have lived through already was just a beautiful part of my learning. That was that was a real gem. Babies I are aware. Very much married for doing that. Mm. And uh, as as we move towards a, a completion, what is it that you would uh, uh, you would like to communicate to young parents? who are thinking of parenthood and they're thinking of having a family of no matter how many children may come to them. What is your um, message to them? I think it is to expect the unexpected to know that it'll be the most challenging and rewarding journey of your life. To know that women have been giving birth for thousands of years and babies have been being born and that both parties know how to do that and 
they work together. It's not the, you as the mother doing it alone. It's not you as the baby doing it alone, but baby and mother work together. They exchange hormones. They The baby pushes with their legs and feet and move their shoulders and burrow with their head to find that path of least resistance. And it really is teamwork <clears throat> and that you don't have to do it alone. And also that layers of support are very important. Um, I brought an exercise into the training of layers of support because I, in America, the families are so isolated and alone now. And um, it really does take a tribe to raise the family, to raise the children. And so to find your layers of support wherever they might be, if it's extended family or the community or friends, whatever, you know, to make sure that each person involved with the birth has two layers of support that, you know, doesn't have to be present in the room, but they can reach out if, if it's needed. And for the families to have that through the pregnancy too, so that as the child's developing, they can already be experiencing what layers of support feels like and to feel the mother and, and partner be able to um, do a good job of self-care and the babies learn so much while they're in the womb about how to take care of themselves, how to set their own boundaries because of, of how the parents are doing that right from the start. So just knowing that, you know, everything has an impact and also that it's never too late to heal everything. It's not about doing it perfectly but it's about making the mistakes we mistake we make and knowing how to do repair. And that's the healthiest thing. Mary, what yes. would you like to communicate to your colleagues, to the young midwives or therapists or educators or other professions? Mm -hmm. uh, what is uh, your message to them? I think just to carry on, you know, to keep doing your great work, that there's so many people out there doing just what I'm doing or Ray or Tara or any of us have been doing, and that we're making a difference in the world, even working one family at a time, we're making a huge impact on the world. And, you know, we throw these seeds out and we don't know which ones will germinate and grow into the forest. But little by little, each person we touch goes and touches 10 more people. And the, each 10 of those touches 10 more. And it just multiplies. So just know that whatever challenges arise in the work, you are going to make it through. And we're all together in this boat. And just keep going with whatever the challenges might be that show up. And Thank you for doing the work with others and the work on yourselves because it does make a huge difference on the planet. So carry on. And to politicians and policy makers or decision makers, what is the message you would like to communicate to them? Wow. That's a big question. <laughs> well, there's so much going on in the world. It's like, yes, we need more kindness in, in the world. We need more open hearted, loving people to be in charge and people with sanity and, and um, wisdom. And I think to keep doing our best to work together to find a way to communicate with each other in a, in a way that's not violent. Like we don't need to hurt each other. We need to support each other. And I know that's ideal and it'll take a lot to get there, but if enough of us do it, it will have an impact. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Is there mm -hmm. anything you would like to add? which I failed to ask, and which should be in this interview. Mm. 
I think, you know, I just want to appreciate everybody who has come before me and and those who aren't with us anymore, you know, and all they contributed in the being the pioneers of this this work and and the pioneers of midwifery. I mean, when I first started there were the midwifery world was just dying and dwindling and around three hundred women started, you know, attending birth all at the same time as lay midwives and um the pioneers we need we need you and keep moving forward you know there's new pioneers coming up and and all the people who are learning this work are bringing new things that they've already learned and experienced and so it's you know shaping in new forms and and i love that that we need to keep the work going out and the younger people to to know what it is so yeah, I'm just grateful for everyone who's been before and who for those who are coming after us. Thank you very much, Mary. And thank Great you to time. you and the board that voted me in. I really appreciate that you recognize my work and I'm really happy to be with you today. Thank you for doing this work, Olga.